we talk a lot about containers. We talk a lot about FinOps. We've done webcasts on, on FinOps. Um, this is like the peanut butter and chocolate of those topics. We're kind of bringing them together. And it's a fascinating topic because there's it's it's very nuanced and challenging. I'll try and uh, portray that as I go through a lot of PowerPoint animations. So um, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, I'm just happy that our copyright says 2022 at the bottom of the slide. That itself is a, a triumph um, in January. So we're ready to go with the new year. I think the topic of this was kind of getting ahead of it for the new year. So, um, you know, I think everybody's moving to containers in some form and getting ahead of it is, I think, very important before there's a lot of sticker shock in the in the bill that you get. So let's dive right in. So some of you may have seen this slide if you've attended uh, other webcasts of ours, just trying to frame the progression that we see the industry going through. Um, you know, we've all seen the virtual environments kind of emerge and then kind of a shift to cloud and now containers on cloud or on virtual. And the challenge we see is that there's, I guess the best way to put it is a lot more moving parts as you move to the right. Um, in the VM world, uh, you're more concerned with your VMs, you know, as a unit of, of management, where you put them, how much resources you give them, understanding what's coming in. Usually these are, these are on-prem environments, so you have to buy well ahead of, you need, of your needs. So capacity planning, strong discipline. Um, but as we shifted the cloud, it became a, a different equation and, and in a good way, mostly, in that you now can just buy on demand. And so it's more about what you're buying because you can actually change what you're buying um, pretty quickly and optimizing how it's turning on and off and the notion of what we call micro-purchasing. So you're buying in small amounts now. You might sign up for and you know, reserve distances in a bigger quantity, but you're buying and you're turning on actually happens at a much more granular level than doing a lease refresh on-prem. Now, containers takes that to another level because it's even more granular. Now, I'm not just working. I'll go through this in some detail. I'm not just working kind of at a VM level. I'm kind of going inside what would typically be in a VM to the almost down to the process level. And it can be organized in all kinds of weird and wonderful ways, pods and replica sets, uh, deployments. So there's more complex structures running. They're more dynamic. And then they also run on nodes, which could be VMs or cloud instances. So it kind of adds a whole new dimension to the problem. And like I mentioned, there was a pretty strong capacity management. There is a pretty strong capacity management discipline for on-prem environments that we see out there has developed over the last decade or so. Um, but as we moved to cloud, there was a bit of a gap where um, I think people kind of lost sight of the capacity planning and management elements of it and just focused on the bill and what people are paying, not the resources that are being used. Um, and we think that there needs to be a little more, uh, the pendulum needs to swing back in that direction, at least partially to say, no, we still have to look at our capacity and our resources um, as we move up. And it's actually possibly becoming more critical as you have so many moving parts. Um, as is automation. And, and I think as you move to the right, um, organizations won't survive without automation. So we'll talk a bit about automation. Um, this is a FinOps topic today, but I'll circle back on automation because they're highly related for container environments. So that's kind of the setup. Um, I'll throw in a couple of FinOps foundation surveys in here. Um, one of them is interesting that there's um, need for automation so they kind of this is from last year i think they're redoing these uh, surveys now but they're not closed yet so the, the new results aren't up uh but from last year's results um obviously automation is a, a big challenge um and it's, not, it's very weak in most organizations and i'll go through why i think a lot of that is especially in container environments and and you know kind of the the, the layout of, of how that needs to happen um but again automation although not obviously linked to finops um, it is actually very highly linked to FinOps when you kind of look at the big picture. Now, let's talk about cloud and container resource optimization. And, and we like to show this kind of pyramid or almost the iceberg of costs where at the top, there's kind of the, 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 the how you're buying is like where you like to put it, and the bottom is the what you're buying. So the top is kind of focused on, you know, savings plans. How do I get a better price on what I'm buying? The bottom is more about the quantity. So we see a lot of features out there, products with features that kind of evolved over the years, that in cloud management that focus on the bill quite a bit. You know, how much is the bill? How do I make sense of it? Who do I charge? Are there any anomalies in it? And then how do I buy better? Um, but our view is that that only gets you so far and you kind of hit a wall. And, and to get below that wall, you need to kind of get out of the realm of finance and more into the engineering realm. And that's the what you're buying. So um, am I buying memory optimized or CPU optimized? 
um, instances in the cloud. Uh, containers, of course, the topic for today. And then how do I make that optimal? What are the different methods? Because it looks quite different when you're doing a DevOps pipeline than if you're just deploying blueprints into a virtual environment. And again, that's the realm of the uh, engineering and app owners. And I'll go through this in some detail uh, because that's very important. IT finance doesn't have direct control over these things. All they can do is try and influence behavior or, or promote behavior in those environments. Now, we were, we were presenting this to a, a head of uh, FinOps who was actually with a, a financial background. And he made an interesting observation that this is really price times quantity is a good way to think of this. And it's an excellent way to think of it. It's, it's the, I can work on the price I'm paying and get so far. At some point, I have to reduce my quantity and the quantity of resources in this case. So how many CPUs, how much memory am I actually using? Can I reduce that? Not using, but buying. Can I reduce the amount I'm buying to more accurately align with what I'm using? It is a good way to think of it. And both those are very important um, for the financial equation um, as I'll get to, especially for, for containers. So um, I mentioned, you know, FinOps, the top part, uh, uh, really the domain of, of the financial teams or increasing the FinOps teams. The bottom part is more the domain of DevOps, but they only go so far. And, and what I mean by that is that, that you know, DevOps typically designed to get new functionality out in a very agile way. Not a lot of DevOps teams that we see go back and revisit what's already running and make it better or even necessarily analyze it in any way. So, um, and, 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 you know, that makes sense because somebody's pounding their fist saying, get that new feature out next week. And, and, and the modern deployment processes are very good at being agile, but are you really looking at all the resources being used and making sense of it? And so we think that that's where this kind of, what we, we nicknamed capacity operations, one of our customers calls it capacity 2.0, a more dynamic form of capacity needs to creep back in here to kind of link these two things together. So we've got agility from the bottom, we have accountability from the top, but there's some kind of analytics layer that's making sense of everything. Uh, and again, if for cloud and especially for containers because it's so complicated. So um, with that backdrop, here's another interesting FinOps Foundation survey about the unsolved pains uh, that they're seeing out there. Um, not specific to containers, but for cloud and containers. Um, and you can see a bunch of uh, uh, things that align with what I've been saying already. I mean, getting engineers to take action is the number one pain. I'll dig into that quite a bit uh, because knowing you have a high cost and actually fixing it are, are two entirely different things. Um, I'll talk a lot about aligning the teams, um, to the tech and the financial procurement teams, because I think there's a big disconnect right now. Uh, reducing waste, of course, and containers are the topic today. So I'll talk quite a bit about this. And, and the other topics on this uh, uh, list are also, um, I mean, you know, relevant to today's conversation, and I'll partially talk about them, but I want to focus on these on these four areas and circle back on them. So let's talk about this gap. So in practice, this is what we tend to see. Um, we have a variety of customers of different sizes and this will be some variation in the way this plays out. But typically there's somebody that owns the app, uh, has accountability for the app and there's somebody that's engineering the app and I'll call them cloud engineers, although for containers, they may not carry that exact title. Um, and they deploy uh, increasingly through some kind of DevOps tool chain into the infrastructure, which could be on-prem, it could be in the cloud, it could be container-based, um, you name it. Uh, there's all the infrastructure. And then what happens is somebody gets a bill and that bill is, is you know, not as, is higher than you want it to be, but all finance can really do in this picture is buy discounts, it, it, you know, oversimplification, but RI, savings plans, um, as I mentioned, they don't have direct control over the source code or the Terraform templates. Um, what they might try and do is, is lob, so there's a big chasm here, and what they might do is try and lob showback reports or try and influence behavior or shame back and all these different things, but they can't directly influence what's happening on the left of this diagram. Um, and so there's a big schism here uh, that I think we see almost everywhere, where there's a disconnect between the people that get the bill and the people that are incurring the costs. Now, in the cloud world, the people on the left might be working within an account and the finance people might say, hey, your account is, you know, it's, it's got a huge bill this month and there might be a more direct connect. But in the container world, there's an even bigger disconnect because quite often there's somebody that owns the container platform itself that may be different. So again, in the cloud world, maybe I'm deploying straight into cloud instances and I own them because, as, the, as the app team. In a lot of our customers, especially the bigger ones, there will be a centralized container team that owns the OpenShift environments or the Kubernetes environments and the clusters and they're, and they're managing the quotas and there's all kinds of management that happens centrally that then the app teams are, are consuming. And so 
they can be different personas, different roles. And again, this further complicates it because when the finance team gets the bill, um, the bill typically shows cloud instances or scale groups. And it might be that person at the bottom that they, that's all they know is the connection is that the, that that's, that's the container cluster. They may not even know who's running containers inside it. Andrew, so, that's, your, that's your platform owner at the bottom. The bottom of your screen, just the very bottom is cut off. So just the label you've got there is your platform owner, right? Yes. Oh, if the contain, let me, um, if you're not seeing the bottom of my screen, let me just kind of. Uh, just the very bottom of it for some reason. There, are we shared? Can mm. you see now? No. Mm. We, see, we see tool chain and providers, but the label below your, your platform owner is not showing. It, okay. okay, I'm not sure that is. So yeah, that is the so the person with the cool hairdo. Um, right. Quite happy is the platform owner. Uh, sorry, you can't see that label. Um, so I think that's a critical that's a critical role here because um, they manage the infrastructure. They are in a unique position to fix this problem. Um, now it may not be their problem. A lot of platform owners we talk to say, I don't really. I'm just giving the app owners what they ask for. Whatever it costs is what they're asking for. They're the app teams. They own it. Um, so. That role is a very interesting one because you might not even care about cost if you're in that role. You're just giving everybody what they want, but you might be in a unique position to fix the problem. Um, so let me, I'll, I'll circle back on this diagram as we go. Um, but again, we see that there's a pretty big disconnect uh, if we want a bridge in the name of in the name of FinOps. And now I have no focus, so I can't change my slide. There we go. So that's time for our first poll. Um, I'm not entirely sure how this poll is going to show up on your screen or if it'll show up on my screen. So um, let me see if I can see it so I can read you the questions. Um, how well do your engineering and app teams contribute to financial interests is the, is the question that people are seeing. Thanks, John. Yeah, I found it now in my... Uh, Better. So, okay. So, yeah. So that poll, if everybody um, can kind of chime in on on whether they have a big disconnect, um, whether they their reports or some analytics, um, or kind of full blown continuous. I'll, I'll I'll go through and talk about what all these tend to look like uh, in continuous optimization. Um, but it looks like as the poll goes on, we're seeing um, a mix. Um, you know, with the dominant. Uh, uh, Answer being uh, reports. Um, oh no! Complete disconnect has just raced up and is now tied with uh, uh, reports. So um, it sounds like everybody on the call is exactly like we would expect. Um, uh, it's kind of a it's, it's again it's a mix out there. And these personas I'm mentioning they do vary quite a bit, and the structures vary quite a bit, um, especially if you're a, a large organization versus a small one. Um, but I'm not sure if I have to wait for the poll to close. I apologize, everyone. We flipped to a different uh, web technology here, so I'm not exactly sure. Okay, looks like um, uh, the poll is now closed, so I'll continue on. Thanks, everyone, for your feedback. And again, the winner was um, sharing basic reports. So there's some communication across that chasm, um, but not in a programmatic way, more of in a, in a visibility kind of way. I, I hit share there, Andrew, so. Okay. Uh, okay. So can everyone see my slides again? Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about containers specifically. And I find this is a, a fun little run of slides because I think it's it's interesting and completely true. Um, and it's kind of more of a thought exercise that we went through here to kind of figure out what's going on with containers. So if I talk about VMs in a say an on-prem environment or cloud instances, they're kind of a, a, a unit of capacity that people understand. If I have a laptop, I, you know, I kind of know what it's doing and I'm running PowerPoint or, or you know, Zoom or go to meeting. Um, and I have, I need four CPUs and a bunch of memory. And it's kind of a unit that, that we kind of know and love and as the unit of measurement and management in, in IT environments in both virtual and the cloud. But the problem is containers don't look that way. Containers are more like opening it up and saying, what's running inside it? It's almost at the process level. Um, it's somewhere in between the two. So, you know, on my laptop at the time I made the slide, I was running four copies of PowerPoint and there's a bunch of things that kind of come and go based on IO. That's more like what containers look like. Um, and so I need to now manage down to this level. I need that visibility down to this level. Um, we're doing some interesting R&D now around understanding the containers that are running and what versions they are. And it's all over the place. Like it's just a wild west of what actually runs in an environment. But from a, from a resource perspective, 
and that, that's probably a topic for another webinar, but for a, a resource perspective, you know, I kind of have to, you know, give these things resources and it's usually in millicores. And so, you know, how many millicores does PowerPoint need? Like, who knows? Like, really, who knows? I, I use PowerPoint every day and I work with virtual container environments every day. I have no idea how many millicores I would give PowerPoint. Um, but that's exactly what you need to do. If I was putting uh, a Terraform file to spin up a PowerPoint, just, you know, theoretically speaking, um, I need to give it millicores and megabytes, requests and limits. Um, and so what do I do? How do I, how do, I do this? Uh, how do I give these values? If I don't know, it behooves me to make these values fairly high to be safe because I don't want my app to crash. Um, so this, this is kind of the root of the problem. And if you kind of map that out to an entire container infrastructure, I'm not going to go through this whole slide, um, uh, but the bottom is the infrastructure in the nodes. The top are the containers I'm running and all those different structures. And the middle part is kind of the joining um, namespaces and projects and, and, and quotas and all those things. And it's pretty complicated. But if I pretend for a minute that the bottom is a bunch of laptops that I need to run my stuff on, um, you know, it, it's on-prem, it could be a lot like laptops because it's a fixed number on, you know, in the cloud, it could be scale groups. Um, I need to figure out how to configure all this stuff to run on the bottom part. Um, and so I went through this mental exercise with my laptop saying, well, if I wanted to assign sizes to things, so I'm running PowerPoint. Um, usually when I do, I'm presenting to people, I don't want to screw up. So I might want to give it 2000 millicores. Um, I use a lot of animations. I'll give it two CPUs and maybe Office, the rest of Office, I'm going to give you know one or two CPUs. I, I run big spreadsheets. Um, I just had to close all my big spreadsheets before this uh, the webcast. I'm going to give them maybe a thousand millicores, maybe two thousand. My video conferencing, ooh, you know, that's a hog. I can actually hear my laptop fan going right now. I better give that a lot of resources. Um, Skype, Teams, you get the idea. I was running at the time 17 web browsers. Uh, again, I just did a survey across my laptop. I was running a demo version of our product um, with a SQL server running. So when I did this exercise, um, and I said, okay, what well, actually what request values would I give the, the, the containers that correspond to what I'm running on my laptop? It added up to um, 28 CPUs, over 28 CPUs worth of resources. Um, if I have to give things size, now of course I don't do that on my laptop because it's all just running in Windows and it all just takes what it needs. And these things aren't all active at the same time, so that kind of works. But if I had to give them resources, if I was gonna run it in some infrastructure that I don't manage, it's gonna, I'm gonna throw it over the fence and it's gonna run in my container clusters, um, I want to give it resources, enough resources for it to work. And so the challenge with that is um, if I'm running that, you know, if, if I did the same exercise and I ran it in a virtual environment like everybody's used to, and I had nodes that had four CPUs, I can run overcommit. And overcommit is designed to say, well, they're not all busy at the same time. So I can give you two CPUs and I can give this other thing the same two CPUs because they're not using it at the same time, which is absolutely true of my laptop. That I'm not using all of these things at once. Um, so it all fits back on one laptop. So with the magic of overcommit, which of course is a big feature of, of virtualization, I can fit this back on one thing, one server, one laptop safely because I can time slice them with each other and I can take that into account in the hypervisor. Containers don't work the same way. These aren't virtual resources I'm giving you. So when I assign millicores to PowerPoint, I can't give the same thousand millicores to a different process. Other, other, other process can use those thousand millicores if it's not using it, but as I dole it out, um, to make them fit, the Kubernetes will not put you on a node if I can't guarantee your request values. So once I've given out all the CPU resources as requested, to things I have to move on to the next one. So this will actually theoretically take eight laptops to run in containers because they don't overcommit. Again, container, they talk about overcommit being the difference between request and limit, but it's not the same as a true overcommit happening in a hypervisor where the exact same resources are just given out to two different consumers um, and I can give out more resources than I have on the box. In the container environment, you can't give out through request values more resources than you have on the box. And this is key because when that, you know, if you talk from a FinOps perspective, that, that finance person on the top right, if you tell me that you're going to need eight times the infrastructure, they're going to have a heart attack. Um, and, but kind of ironically, this is not far off from what we see happening. Maybe not eight times, but it is exactly what happens in practice. And this creates a big cost challenge um, and creates a perception that containers are expensive. 
containers aren't expensive. They're just a thing. They're just something that runs. It's, it's how you manage them that makes them expensive. So let's move out of the PowerPoint laptop world into the real data center world. So I've got Kubernetes running. I'm running a bunch of nodes. I'll talk about cloud uh, mainly here, um, running in scale groups. So those orange boxes might come and go based on load. And I'm going to run some containers that have a spec with these requests and limits. And as I've hopefully made the point, uh, well, who knows what goes in these files? Um, again, people tend to err on the side of safety and, and, and make them too big. Um, but even the most enlightened person, unless you have you know, something analyzing the running workloads that you've already deployed, it's going to be a guess as far as what goes in here. Um, so that goes and deploys. It goes through the scheduler, and they get put on the nodes. Now, the Tetris block is a metaphor for the actual workload, so the utilization pattern of the, of the, of the containers or pods. The dotted line is the resource allocation or the request values. So when I ask for too much, more than I actually need when I run, what happens is it'll spread out across the nodes and those nodes won't be fully utilized because I can't run more on those nodes if I've given out all the resources. Um, and so in practice, um, that tends to look like this. And I'll just pull both these curves up. So this is an actual container cluster. It's a real one. Um, we do this in a lot of customers and they all look like this. It's kind of uncanny it's how it looks like this, where um, the scheduler is giving out, the left is the is the request values, the sum of the request values. So the, the scheduler is giving out you know, 80 to 90% of the resources of the cluster, which is pretty good. That's, that's you know, I've deployed all the millicores, in this case, um, two containers that are on the floor. But the right-hand side is the utilization um, of that. And in this case, it was an average of 7% peaking to about 17 or 18%. Um, this is real, this is a real environment. And it, we, we kind of chuckle because they all kind of look like around 7%. We've seen some maybe around 10. There's been the odd case where one is really well uh, managed, but for the most part, it's like this. Um, and so, and again, the, the culprit is these aren't virtual resources. So when I give out the millicores in the request values, I can't give them out twice. And so once I've given them all out, um, you run low utilization, that equals high cost. Um, the, the shock factor is, you know, virtual environments, when we analyze them, that are running general purpose workloads, not container workloads, tend to be, from what we've seen, this is a this is a, you know, not an overly scientific estimate, but from analyzing customers, about three to eight times this. So the average utilization of ESX servers in a mature VMware environment can push 40 or 50%. Um, in this case, it's seven. So this is a, a big problem. Um, I'm not sure everybody knows it's a big problem yet because not everybody has visibility into this happening. A lot of times we'll run our analytics and they'll see this for the first time. Like, hey, wait a minute. Now, I didn't realize um, it was so low utilization. In VMware environments, it's masked because the hypervisor might think all the memory is being used because uh, Linux caching. So there's all kinds of, that's a whole topic into itself. But when you get down to it, the utilization of the nodes is very low. So this it's a resource challenge, but it makes a financial challenge because this is going to be a very expensive environment to run, and it's going to look way more expensive than the virtual environment it's replacing, um, which, again, tends to, tends to be shock for those who have actually realized this is happening. So, which leads us to the next poll, and you can probably guess what this poll is um, based on what I just said. Um, are your container clusters well utilized? Um, and again, there's a range of answers here, and it's perfectly fine to say you have no idea because that's, you know, that's in our view, that's quite common um, when you're deploying these things, or especially if you're only in development uh, and you're not heavily in the prod yet, um, it may not have bubbled to the surface that you need to track this type of thing. So if everyone can kind of take a look at those answers, um, uh, do you look like what I just showed on the screen, or are you better than it, or are you perfect, or, um, you know, not in the containers yet. Uh, again, some people attend these uh, webinars just to to get um, some education into the, the upcoming challenge. So if you haven't deployed containers yet, that's fine too. Um, and it looks like just from the early results coming through, a bunch of people don't have containers deployed yet, uh, and or they have no idea, or they look just like what we said. So for those that have um, containers, um, it's either what we said or don't know. And then there's some people that don't have uh, them deployed yet. So we'll just wait for that to close and um, we can publish the answers. 
Yep. So again, the 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 um, for those that have containers, it's kind of an even split between no idea and um, exactly like what I just showed. So uh, again, it's a resource problem I, I mentioned, and I'll, I'll get to automation in a minute. But it, it creates a, uh, a big financial challenge, which again, it's silly to say that containers are expensive because they're just a bunch of processes. It, they they aren't inherently um, expensive or not. Okay, so I'll just continue on. And Chuck, can you confirm that you can still see the next slide because my screen just kind of yep, went away. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so this is what container optimization looks like. This is our container screen, and I don't want to make this webinar about our product uh, too much, but I wanted to show what it looks like. So this is a um, an analysis of a set of, in, in this case, a third column. You can see there's some deployments, some pods. Uh, these are at the rows are containers, but they're in they're, they're in deployments and pods. Um, and there's a variety of optimizations occurring here um, where they need to be made bigger or smaller or both. Sometimes they need to be made, some parts need to be made bigger uh, or they're unspecified. I'll talk about this more in a minute, all the different things we see. But you can see here, this optimization type is, is telling us that there's a whole variety of problems in this environment. Again, this is a, a real environment. Um, and if I pick on one container here, the top one, um, I, I'll, I'll go back to those numbers in a second. This is the CPU utilization um, by hour. It's a 24 hour view. So it's kind of machine learning to figure out what the pattern is of this thing. And the, the thin part is the peak and the thick part is the sustained activity. So the third quartile, the median, the first quartile. So the way you read this is that every hour it's spending half its time in that thick blue zone, going as high as the top and as low as the very bottom of those thin parts. And, and in this case, the requests and limits are overlaid. The, the yellow line is the request value and the purple line is the limit value. In this container, they're both set to the same value. So that's not usually a good strategy. That just means you have, a, it's like a fixed partition. I'm, I'm giving you four CPUs and you can't have more than four CPUs. So you can't spread your wings and use other capacity if it's not being used, but you're also being given four CPUs and they're yours. So um, again, other people can dip into your four CPUs if you're not using them, but the scheduler will only stack things up until it's given out all the CPUs. So what we're saying here is on the on the left, you know, we see that there's four hours of, of kind of peak usage midday, um, peaking up as high as four and a half CPUs. Uh, sustained activity is lower. So we're suggesting, you know what, you should you should bring the request down and push the limit up. It's a typical, there's a fairly typical uh, pattern we see. You don't need to give out all those resources because there will be some sharing uh, on the nodes. But your limit should be higher. You don't want to constrain the resort, the, the, the application either. So um, this is just kind of one example. Um, I won't get into memory in this webcast. We did a whole other webcast on containers where we dug deep into the memory patterns and memory risks. Um, so you can probably view a recording of that webcast if you want to dig deeper into this. Um, and, uh, and the net net is we again we need to give it um, less of a CPU request or, uh, or bring down the CPU request, bring up the limit, bring down the memory requests. And you can see the overall impact across the top there of, of doing this. So um, that's kind of a, a, a grander view of a container. You see there's a whole list here of containers of what to do to optimize it um, using analytics to kind of make these numbers based on science, in fact, not just um, guesses or, or fear. So let me relate this back to this, circle back to this diagram. We've got the different people involved here. Um, typically, like I mentioned, the platform owner is in a position to fix this because they can deploy analytics that analyzes all the containers and says, okay, here's the patterns. Let me learn, analyze, come up with some really great recommendations and fix the problem. And so, and this is a pattern you would see in a virtual environment, of course, that's the way you do this because you would go and resize the VMs, maybe open a change ticket saying, hey, do you guys mind if we resize your, your, your VMs and then making it happen by resizing the running VMs. Um, you can't do that anymore. You can't go directly back and change things that are running because they're coming from code. Um, and this is very important. You can't just go, if I change something in the field, it just changes back to whatever's in the Terraform file. Terraform is very good at doing that. It's one of its strengths is that the runtime always matches the code. So you have to go upstream to the code. And more so than just the code, you have to go to the app owner because um, one thing we've learned very, very clearly in working with our customers is that Nothing will happen unless the person that's responsible for that app wants it to happen. If those are the crown jewels of your company and you're running a trading system or, or account sign up systems, um, you're not going to touch it uh, unless somebody wants you to touch it. And that's where 
this kind of gap kind of still persists that even if there might be a cost challenge on the right, um, the people on the left need to understand and, and, and make sure they need to fix it. And so, so from the people that own it, it's an understanding problem and approval. I need to let it happen. And then of course, there's an automation in codifying it because you need to get a line of code in a file somewhere to actually change these things. So there's kind of two elements. We call them human readable and machine, machine readable. Um, and those are necessary outputs to make all this happen. You can't just shortcut and say, okay, now I'm just gonna change things and, and, and fix them. It doesn't, doesn't work in a DevOps pipeline or any kind of modern cloud or container environment. So again, I'll circle back on this a bit later, but let's talk about this understanding. So the, 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 the app owner needs to understand um, what's happening. And the challenge is, if I go back to that first slide, um, understanding is harder and harder because you know, we were on with a customer recently where we had up analytics for about, I think it was 38,000 containers. Um, that, that UI had 38,000 rows in it. So each individual row was extremely smart and you know, we should do this with this pattern and we're gonna pattern and do that stuff, but there's 38,000 of them. And they're saying, well, this is awesome, but we need to see this by application or, or by some other, we need to kind of look at it more in aggregate. So there's a sheer scale, means just understanding what's happening is hard. And then there's the complexity. So I talked about setting these values. Each of these values can be too big, it can be too small, it can be not set at all. Um, we see all these things happening and there's lots of values per container and there's lots of containers in the pods and there's lots in the deployments and there's tons of these things. So we've got thousands and thousands of entities with multiple potential problems. How on earth do I understand this? So we did a lot of uh, looking into this and you know, we, we, we kind of, um, we're big on visualization. We always have been, we thought, well, how can we, can we come up with a way to see what's happening in a way that's more easily understood? Um, and what we came up with was, was this view. And I'll show you a few of these. It's, it's a histogram, it's like a frequency distribution. And so let me, let me try and explain what we're looking at. And you can run this against an entire company and it draws a, a, a great picture of what's happening. So, this is, a, I'm looking at memory here that we do this for CPU and memory. These are the memory requests of the containers that are running. And obviously the green means the memory requests are, are correct. The, um, the vertical axis is the number of containers. So in this case, it looks like I have about 23 containers. This is not a very big environment that are correct. They're, they're as they should be from a resource specification perspective. Um, if you go to left or right, then we're getting into either too small. So I did not give those containers enough resources. Um, you see at the very top, you see pod termination risk. That's a risk area. So if you're too far in the red, uh, you could actually get killed by the scheduler. And the yellow is things that are too big, which is the financial risk zone. In this case, we're stranding memory. We're giving out more memory than we need to be giving out. The gray bar is unset. So those are things that actually don't have a value, which is its own separate problem. Um, and so here you can see a kind of a variety of, of things happening in one environment. Uh, some things are dangerous, some things are wasteful. Um, and again, I can see just at a glance, this environment, which probably has you know, just over hundred containers, um, what's happening in this environment. So the shape, the distribution, we see all kinds of interesting shapes. I'm not gonna run through all those shapes today. Again, there was another webcast that kind of focused on, on the, the, the container um, shapes and sizes and patterns and stuff. But we can see the risks and inefficiencies and how far things are spread out. Because um, again, at the far right, that 500% is things that are five times bigger than they need to be. At the far left, that 20% is things that are one fifth the size they need to be. And surprise, surprisingly, we see a lot in those zones. So let's let's look at a, a real environment here. This is a an entire environment. It's not a huge environment. You can see there's 432 containers and 310 pods across 40 namespaces. So it's actually a pretty small environment, but it's indicative. Um, and we are over for CPU and memory, not horrendously, 28%, uh, 15%. But if you look at the patterns at the bottom here, um, you can see, again, there's spreads. There's a bunch of things that are okay. And then for CPU, there's things that are too small and they're too big. And for memory, there's things that are way too small and a whole lot of stuff that's too big. And so this is part of the challenge is that you can error in both directions and it kind of cancels out. So we were actually looking at a customer, we, we did this for an entire data center, thousands and thousands of containers, and it was on an aggregate, almost perfect. They, 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 they almost averaged out to be the exact amount of resources, but underneath, everything was wrong. Everything was, like, all, like the vast majority were either in the yellow or the red and quite far. So they were almost getting lucky that, that things are working okay because the containers are very poorly specified, but 
they're averaging out, the, the errors up are canceling the errors down and you're kind of getting away with it. So um, this is an environment, this is just, in this case, it's only 400, just over 400 containers, um, but you can point this at an entire environment, entire cloud provider, everything I'm running in Amazon and see it in, in one picture. Um, if I drill down, this is actually a, a, um, a line of business in that environment, zooming in on one line of business. So I think this environment had four or five different lines of business. This one has about 172 containers. Now you start to see an interesting picture where um, the, the, the pattern, the green is much smaller here and the yellow and gray are much bigger. Um, so that big spike at 500%. So in this case, a large part of their environment was over five times bigger than they need to be. So back to the topic of this webcast, that's a FinOps problem. That, that's a cost problem. It's got to go through all those layers, but this is going to mean those containers end up taking up more nodes than they need, need to. If it's in the cloud, those nodes are scale groups. The scale groups are bigger than they need to. They're running more nodes. The bill is high. So somewhere somebody's going to get a bill for this environment, and it's going to be expensive. It's probably because of that big yellow bar right there. Um, and again, this, this isn't a very bad environment. I, I'm not showing... Um, and he said, uh, there's, there's many, many worse environments that we've seen out there. I'm just kind of showing some generic stuff here. Now, on the that's CPU. On the memory side, interestingly, there's an under allocation in this line of business. So the red bars, that 35% means there's a whole lot of containers that are a third the size they need to be for memory, which is actually a risk. It's a pretty big risk. Uh, unless other lines of business are over-specifying their um, memory, saving you, um, you might have a problem here. Your net memory is too low. So and again, that spread is, is there's high and low, but the net is minus 7% roughly, it looks like. So I net net don't have enough memory allocated out and net net, I have quite a bit too much CPU out there. So this is gonna be the lose-lose of high cost and high risk. Um, now, I just wanna show a couple more examples because th that's an entire, this is kind of a homogeneous view where I'm looking at all the stuff in a line of business or an entire app that could be the, the databases and the queue managers and all these types of things. We can also single out a specific type of container. And this is where it gets even more interesting probably. So across all lines of business, if I just look at this container, this is an Istio proxy. So it's a sidecar running in my container for managing the IO. If I just look at those components across all my apps, is a completely different picture. Now these ones are almost all wrong. In CPU, only five of the 83 are actually correct. A bunch are too low, a bunch are too high, and none of them are right for memory, zero. In fact, they're almost all, a whole ton of them are way too small. So that slice is valuable as well. So viewing it by app or by a line of business gives an interesting view of which lines of business are, are doing a good job, which ones aren't, but also by component. So at the infrastructure level, whoever is deploying Istio proxies should up their game and configure them correctly uh, because whoever is deploying Nginx is doing a great job. Um, same environment, there's only uh, six of these running, but they're all exactly as they should be. So again, that's just kind of a, a way of visualizing the container risks and inefficiencies. Um, again, the yellow directly maps to a financial problem, the red directly maps to an operational problem. We see them all, but that's a critical element for kind of uh, um, communicating what on earth is going on. And then all those numbers also feed the automating of what's going on. So if I take those numbers I showed in the UI, we do that analysis, take the numbers, update the, um, the manifests up or down, quite often it's down more than up, but it goes both ways. Um, Kubernetes will redeploy the containers with better resource specifications that more closely align with what they actually need. When you do that, Kubernetes will automatically run things on fewer nodes. Kubernetes works great. It's, it's, it's just more of a garbage in, garbage out problem. If you give it the wrong spec, it'll do what you asked it. If you give it the right spec, you'll run on fewer nodes. Bang, the bill goes down. And then the second pass, which I won't talk about today, we talk about more in our cloud uh, optimization, is now the scale group nodes can be changed. Because a lot of times what we see is the CPU goes way down, memory may be less so, and I can move to a different type of node. I can move to a memory optimized node is quite a common path we see. So now that I've optimized the request values, I'm no longer constrained by all that stranded capacity and I can realign my infrastructure. Um, you know, On-prem, you might have to do this on a refresh, but in the cloud, I can do this more dynamically. So I can just change my scale groups to be a different type of instance and boom, I'm, uh, I've got double um, effect of, of the optimization. Um, a couple more slides, we're close to the end. So there's an example, this is a customer example. It's a case study that's on our website of exactly this. So this is um, a bank in Europe. This is their DevOps 
deploy process. I won't go through all those bars, but basically they're doing exactly what I described, analyzing the, the workloads and the patterns. Um, then in the deploy step, they will hit our APIs to get the requests and limits from the analytics. And they go through a bunch of really cool sounding uh, uh, templates and it's OpenShift templates in this case, and um, update the deploy to reflect the analytics and the latest values. This is exactly what we're describing is let the machine do it, let the analytics do it, the, the humans, are, but they were off focusing on functionality and not on millicores and megabytes. And so um, this was very successful. They actually managed to cut their infrastructure spanning in half by doing this. Um, so really great success. And when we did the visualization of their environments, they were some of the nicest we've seen. So this is what those visualizations look like if analytics and automation are in play. You have a lot more green. There's still some stuff that, that uh, is maybe pending automation, but um, the green bar dominates. And this is exactly what we're describing. So the, the yellow in the wings has gone way down. Cost has gone way down, um, kind of the holy grail. So there's, this is a great example of this actually in action. Um, and back to the kind of the stylized view of it, what this means is that we learn and analyze, we generate artifacts, rather than going straight back to the providers, you actually generate human readable, machine readable, those go to the appropriate people to fulfill their mandates. The machine readable then, of course, slipstreams into the automation process. Approval is important, so all of this happens with approval. Um, some container environments, like the, the, the previous one I showed, you can negotiate to not need approval for changing the resources. Um, but either way, when there's approval, um, it automatically updates the on the next deploy, it automatically updates and optimizes it. And then it spins off the next time you see the bill, back to that, that pyramid slide, the quantity has changed. I mean, I, I'm using fewer resources. I, I, I may or may not have discounts on these RIs and savings plans, but regardless, there's fewer nodes in the bill. And so that frown on the finance person goes away. And so that's container FinOps in our view. It's kind of, it starts upstream at the optimization. There's a visibility port, of course, of providing reports and things, but going upstream into the, into the flow, um, and it kind of hits off all of these points um, very effectively and more than just the ones that are highlighted um, by doing that. So I think I ran a minute longer than I wanted to, but that's my content. I'll hand it back over to Chuck. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, a very interesting content. And, you know, it begs the question, you know, why, why would you leave it up to best guesses to, uh, to come up with these values? When you, when you see the data, from re real environments, it, it, it's very clear that uh, that's, a, that's not a, a reliable way to operate over the long term, either from a cost or risk perspective. And, and, and Chuck, I think the people putting those values in those files probably don't want to be doing that. Like humans shouldn't be typing these. We saw a spelling mistake, like a lowercase m to a capital M, which instead of millicores was megacores. Like it was in a limit value, so it didn't blow the system up. But this it, humans shouldn't be touching those files, nor do they probably want to be touching those files that should come from the machine. Yeah, and you know, amazingly, we have computational horsepower that can figure this stuff out for you. So there really is no no reason to do that. Um, if you have questions, uh, and there are a few questions here. Please uh, enter them in the uh, in the console. Um, but I, before we go to questions, I did want to point out uh, that this kind of visibility is uh, readily available. Um, we have a partnership with Intel. Uh, Intel Cloud Optimizer is an offering by Intel for Intel customers that uh, allows you to have this kind of visibility uh, through Densify, um, fully funded by, by Intel for qualifying customers. So it is uh, targeted at larger enterprises. And if you'd like to understand whether your organization could qualify to have this funded by Intel for a full year, uh, you can uh, just follow the uh, the QR code there or uh, visit our website and fill in the request form for more information. It's a probably a 15 to 20 minute conversation to figure out whether your organization fits and uh, you can have this kind of kind of view. Um, but let's let's jump to uh, some questions. Um, a question Andrew on uh, the applicability of this this kind of approach when you have more transient workloads versus, you know, maybe more traditional workloads? So it's interesting. So we do see a, a mix of kind of legacy monolithic apps being put into containers that kind of run forever and are complex and then more 
elementized microservices. Again, it costs because we see a mix and even different groups in the same customer might have a mix. For the, for the transient kind of ephemeral microservices, it's interesting because I think there's a feeling that, well, it doesn't matter if they're wrong, it only runs for 10 minutes or it's only using 30 millicores or whatever that is. But if it's twice as big as it needs to be, that adds up. So if I have a million microservices that are twice as big as they need to be, it adds up to the same problem. So I think there's kind of this fallacy that that, that tiny things don't matter. Um, like the grains of sand don't matter, but the grains of sand, if they're all size wrong, it actually adds up to an even bigger problem. But ironically, what we find is that a customer might have a handle on the sizing of a of a big, you know, a big thing that takes four or eight CPUs. They, they probably actually have visibility into it because it's a big workload. All the tiny stuff can just be completely out of control because nobody seems to really think it's going to be a problem. But again, a million tiny things dwarfs the, the big thing. And and so that's, you know, that's the, the microservices, same, exact same thing applies. It may not have run long, but you need to give it the right amount of resources or you'll just end up with the exact same problem. And it's even harder to understand why um, when there's so many small things, because you may not, they may have come and gone and, and they're gone now and you don't even know what they did. So the analytics does the same thing for those uh, as far as kind of looking at all the, 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 the replica sets and stuff like that to make sure that you're getting it right. Uh, the, the, another question, this one is, uh, I think, quite quite interesting. The slides address memory and CPU uh, as if they are mutually exclusive but not address the fact that they're often linked in a machine. Uh, we see CPU waste that is due to required memory specs on a machine. Um, AWS is coming out with or already has a new line of machines with increased memory per CPU. Can you comment on that? So I think so. Sorry, I, the, what was the very first part? First part of that, what you said there, the the slides ad ad addressed memory uh, and CPU as if they are mutually exclusive, not addressing that they're often linked on the same physical machine. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So that so I guess the point is that I'm buying a machine that has CPU and memory, um, and we do see a lot of customers doing maxed out memory um, and still not using all of their CPUs, but they're already at the memory optimized. So the the move towards even higher memory is a good one because I think that's we do see that as a primary constraint in these environments. Um, there's still optimization to be had. Like they're both optimized independently. So we something we see memory go up, CPU go down, something vice versa. Usually they both net out to be down. Um, uh, so that it's it's you know there's still savings to be had on both. But I think the move, you know, it's it's a constant alignment of the infrastructure with the demand. I guess is what we're seeing. And and, and containers are more memory efficient because they share the actual executables. Um, but they still that still seems to be the big constraint. So I think that move is positive. The more memory you can get deployed, the better in our mind. Um, we also, I, I, we don't have it deployed in our product, but have done R&D and are looking at things like memory footprint optimization to make sure that, that containers are scheduled on common nodes if they use common configurations. So they will share more. Um, but you know the analysis we're seeing right now is that the versions that are out there are so all over the place. Even that's a bit of a challenge in most customers now because of the sheer diversity of what's being used in the container environments. But there's lots of optimization that I think is coming down the pipe on that front. But yes, the, the more memory is better. More memory optimized nodes um, is, is better and better for everyone. Uh, related question um, in, in the differences between consuming or provisioning containers in the cloud versus on-prem uh, as it relates to uh, efficiency and optimization, perspective on that. So the, the biggest thing I think is that the you can't just flex down scale groups on-prem. You've got it on the floor. You need to have enough for peak. You always have, um, unless you're kind of bursting, but we don't see a lot of that. So um, on-prem, you still have to have a planning cycle and forecasting that lets you have enough on the floor for the demands. Uh, now there's some really clever things being done by, you know, the the the, the server providers around uh, uh, um, consumption-based, where you can have more on the floor, but just pay for what you're using. That's really cool. Um, but in general, you have to have enough on the floor. I suppose in the cloud, where I can flex my scale groups. So in the cloud, it's more about you know the, the dynamic, making sure that the elasticity is configured properly to go up and go down. On-prem, it's kind of a little more around forecasting, like it would have been in a, a VMware environment. And if you're running on VMware, of course, then then it's kind of slipstreams in the same process sometimes. So the the management of capacity for on-prem containers can fall under the same team doing VMware. In the cloud, it if it's in the cloud, it's obvious it's not falling on the same team as doing VMware. So there's kind of a split there organizationally as well. But the biggest thing is the elasticity. On on-prem, you just have to have enough there for what you're going to need um, and, and plan it out a little bit differently. The stranding and everything else is identical. If, if the containers are too big, you know, I, I kind of alluded to in one of those slides where 
In a virtual environment, we see the ESX server utilization much lower for Kubernetes environments uh, because of this challenge I've been describing and then the, then the general VM workload, just because the overcommit isn't occurring the same way. So um, many of the same problems, but it kind of plays out a bit differently and possibly in different groups, I guess is the point. So a follow-up question to the memory and CPU one, um, but uh, Andrew, can you advance the slide? There were a couple of other informational slides there that we wanted people to see. I think there's a FinOps Foundation, yeah, uh, some links that you may not be aware of as far as uh, uh, training and education in the space. Um, the follow-up question is that these machines uh, are often maxed out in memory with no recourse and would appear as underutilized as far as CPU uh, in these metrics. Uh, they're struggling with this and, and don't see a solution uh, to, this, to this challenge. So um, again, there, that is a challenge. If you're using all the memory and the, now the question becomes, does the app need all that memory? And if it's yes, then you're basically kind of stuck to the memory. Um, there's a bunch of things we see happening in there that are still possible. Uh, again, there's the the, um, the the fact that and this is a big one, especially for on-prem. The memory being reported at the hypervisor tier isn't actually the memory being consumed by the container. So so we see this a lot, and it's kind of interesting in that um, because it's Linux, buffer caches can chime in and consume a lot of the memory. So the outside model might be seeing that and look like you're using. We just hit this with a customer recently, where on the outside it looked like the memory is being used well on the nodes, but when you look inside the container level, it wasn't. It was just because Linux kind of gobbles up the rest of the memory and SQL servers do it too and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so the outside reporting was actually misreporting how effectively the memory was being used. So even in the most memory constrained environments, we find there's still slack, there's still opportunity there. Um, so again, there's a whole bunch of things. Big JVMs different again, if your big JVMs uh, are consuming all the memory, you know, at some point you will be stuck with that, what you're running. And then of course, nodes with bigger memory help but a lot of times we're finding, no, if you, if you peel away the layers, there's more to it than just that. And it could just be that the, the app is, team is asking for more memory than they need, or maybe the app doesn't need to run nonstop. That's the other thing we see is that somebody deployed an app. We saw this where the, the, the container running a batch job was running all day, chewing up memory, even though it was only active at 8 p.m. Like they just didn't turn it off, um, which is kind of a simple thing. So there's, again, a bunch of dimensions still to be explored on that uh, if you're memory constrained. It may be that you don't need all that memory all day, every day, um, but the measurements look like you do. Um, and and there, there's a follow-up question just with respect to um, acknowledging, does the technology acknowledge that um, there may be underutilized CPU um, related to that? I think, you know, the, the, the offer stands that if you'd like to see your environment um, through this kind of lens, uh, it it is uh, available and and uh, Andrew, maybe you could just reference what what it takes to set up and gather data and and have this kind of view. How much effort required to do that? Sure, yeah, no, it's it's pretty quick. I mean, um, there's a VMware data collection path, but but that's that's um that's a forwarder that's pretty easy to set up. But for the cloud, we just hit the APIs for the the scale groups and the nodes and the RDS instances and all that stuff. So that's just basically a, a credential exercise. It happens very quickly. And then the containers, there's a simple forwarder that just forwards the Prometheus and node exporter data back. So it's a, it's a pretty simple deploy. Um, again, there's kind of one, one container to enable the, 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 the container level collection and then there's the APIs for the cloud level. So it's pretty low impact. We don't, there's no agents or anything like that. It just kind of uses the APIs to get the data. Um, and it'll draw that picture pretty quick. I think, Usually when we show people that the histogram is they get kind of curious about what theirs might look like. Um, and are you truly maxed out or are there a whole bunch of things that are just kind of incorrect? And we see many, many patterns. Like we see some that are just way in the yellow, some that are way in the red. Uh, like I mentioned, one that looks on average just right, but when you dig under the covers, nothing is right. But it's just right, it's just wrong in both directions. So um, absolutely, if you want to see these pictures, uh, right from the, the containers to the pods, through the nodes down to the scale groups, that's pretty quick to set up as far as data collection. And it's safe to say that we will always surface uh, actionable and or useful information in, in most environments. It's, it's uh, usually a big advancement on, on uh, what you might have available today in, in traditional tooling, just because the analytics are, are so tailored to our, for, for peering into this kind of environment and, and bringing forth uh, actionable information. 